well, thanks for inviting me on. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a, a little bit of a crazy period. So uh, for all kinds of reasons. So it's uh, the breath is the perfect thing to have to, <laughs> to be using during craziness. Yeah. So what made what made you write this book? The the reason I wrote the book, I mean, it, it a number of factors came to be for me to write the book. The principal reason is that it's it's been breathing practices and utilizing the breath has been my uh, principal practice for the last 30 years since since I ran into Buddhism and Hatha Yoga, whatever, almost 30, 30 years ago now in Nepal when I was living there. And up to this point, um, it's been the thread that has been sort of woven through all of my practices. Um, and then... And then more recently, um, my editor of um, Patty Gift, she, we, I was talking to her and, and I was telling her how I, I teach meditation as well. And almost all of my meditation, almost all of the people who I, who I share meditation with and whatnot, I had sort of like switched over since COVID to like focusing specifically on breathing protocols, at least to get the, to, uh, before meditation or it might even remain to be the main practice because of the power that the breath has to set the body and mind in the sort of perfect receptacle for meditation to arise. So based on that, my editor, she was like, why don't you write a book about that? And so there you go. Um, so then I put, so it wasn't just about that. I put together, I started back 30 years ago. And, um, and so there's these different parts of the book, which I think that you're familiar with. Yeah. No, I'm I'm really interested to to read it. You're so you know you, your background is is interesting, and I think maybe we should share that before we go any further because I found you through in the shadow of the Buddha. Yeah, way back so recent. I, thought, I was like, what happened to Mateo? Where's he at these days? <laughs> and then yeah, you came out with this book. So uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about your background because it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, the that book in the shadow of the Buddha was the first book. So this meditate. So the book that I, I just wrote, uh, "Breathe How You Want to Feel," is my fifth book. So the first book was in the shadow of the Buddha, and that book chronicled this. It's it's a part memoir, part biography, um, and it tells the. I used to. I lived in Nepal for for a, a, almost a decade in Kathmandu, and while I was living there, I was working in Tibet, and my job was to smuggle information out of Tibet and out of China, uh, human rights abuse information, data, photographs and whatnot, and documents to smuggle that information out to human rights organizations in the West. So that was my job. And I wrote about that in The Shadow of the Buddha. But during that whole period of time, what I was actually doing when I was in Tibet, apart from gathering information that the Chinese government didn't want the world to know about, was I was sort of following the in the footsteps of a of a Tibetan mystic by the name of Tertan Sogyal Lerab Linkpa. So I was really interested in this in this uh, in this character. He li lived in the 1800s. He was a he was a like I said he was a mystic. He was a teacher to the previous Dalai Lama. So the current Dalai Lama is the 14th. He was a teacher to the 13th Dalai Lama. And um, I had his sort of the sketch of his life. And so I ended up going to everywhere that he lived uh, and practicing and, and receiving teachings and meeting Tibetan Buddhist masters uh, there uh, all the while, while I was doing my work as well. So that first book weaves these two stories together, this journey, this sort of political journey, if you will. And the second is Tertan Sogyal's life. And I sort of wove them together in that book, In the Shadow of the Buddha. Yeah, that's it's extraordinary. And the smuggling in and out is... I mean, you were at great risk. At that time, you know, at that, it's crazy to think about it. The yeah. first time I went, the first time I went to Tibet, there wasn't internet yet. So, uh, in the like, it was just arriving, nineteen ninety eight. So, I mean, this this is a while ago now, right? So, it was just, the internet was just arriving. So, it was possible to do that. They didn't have the currently nobody like myself or anybody else could do that type of work because of the massive surveillance system that China has uh, throughout China in Tibet, Xinjiang and elsewhere. At that time, it was it wasn't that way. I mean, it was a, a, I was actually going to uh, Internet cafes. I would collect information, take photographs and collect documents. I would go to Internet cafes. I, I actually had um, I would I would turn off the computer. And I would re I would reboot it 
and I would upload software on the computer that I could use to circumvent the Chinese firewall. And then I would upload the uh, information I had to a website we created to the back end of a website that was actually on Thai cooking. Actually, I never told this. I didn't even put this in the in the book, I don't think. It was for Thai cooking. It was in the recipe section. Somebody had access in Washington, D.C. to this information. I would just upload it there. So um, so the risk involved, I mean, there there was some risk, but I never felt as though I was, I was uh, sort of the Chinese police nabbed me twice, but they didn't know what I, I was just because of the area. I was in closed areas. But the real risk was really the 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 Tibetans and the Chinese who I worked with. I had a handful of of translators and other people that was that were helping me. And so I wrote the book after they had all uh, after they were all safe. I had come back out. I had left I had left I had left living in Asia. I moved back to France for a while and then to America. And then after some time, they all had left. and so it was it was safe enough to uh, to to write the book. and um and I could never I actually I saw a translation of it in Chinese by the Chinese, um, by the, like the, uh, the secret, they call it the secret service, um, the public security, actually they call it the public security bureau. That's what it's usually known as the public security bureau, um, translated it. And, um, as a, as a, as a document to try to figure out who it was I was working with. And I actually saw photographs of it. I was never able, I still haven't been able to go back to, to China, and sub or Tibet. I mean, it's just, um, uh, since the book came out, I I applied for a visa twice, and the Chinese oh, really? government just I went to pick up my passport with the visa, and they just gave it back to me. Yeah, like yeah. No, there's no words; they just gave it back to me. They didn't. <laughs> they, it wasn't sort of refused or anything. They just gave me the passport back. Wow, get the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first book, In the Shadow of the Buddha, and then you know this 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 character Tertan Sogyal, who I had uh, researched and I wrote a lot about In the Shadow of the Buddha, then. Afterwards, my publisher said, hey, what about writing his straight up biography? Because I'd been researching it then for over a decade. And that was the whole next journey of writing his biography in full. I translated much of his biography from Tibetan with the help of, um, of a Tibetan monk friend of mine, Lama Karma, in, uh, who lives in, in India and, um, and Switzerland. And uh, he helped me translate part of it, and, or he did the translation. I was doing the sort of writing of it. And then we, wrote, we, we did that book. That was called Fearless in Tibet, The Life Story of the Tibetan Mystic. Uh, the, um, that, and it was, yeah, it was, it was a great, that was a great, I felt so satisfied when I, when I published that book. It felt like I really, nobody had written about that in English, um, his life story. And I felt like I made a real contribution with that. So that was a, it was a great, um, you know, when you write about somebody, when you're writing a biography of somebody, you really are trying to think about their perspective, like, like literally the ground that they walked on and how did they feel and how was the weather and what were they smelling and what were they seeing? And, and then there's all of that outer aspect. And then we have the inner aspect based upon his writings. So you're sort of imagining that. So it really is this merging, like you're sort of like melding your mind with, with the mind of the person that you're writing about, which of course is the classic way of, of talking about guru yoga, this, this uh, like water being poured into water. This, so you're constantly doing this for, for two and a half years. I was constantly doing this, writing, writing his life story. So um, I felt blessed to be able to do that, and it, it, it was wonderful. I still, I still feel like I have a very close relationship with with with, uh, with that mystic, with Larry Blinkba. Yeah, that that's beautiful. I love the way you just said that. I think that's so great. You've been, because you, the the idea of embodiment, you've embodied it, and what it mm -hmm. taught you to do that, like the full sensory, physical, mental experience, and you and then you tied it to Guru Yoga. That's I, I, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> and you were doing a lot of practices at this time too, right? A lot of practices, yeah, yeah. I met some of his lineage holders there, uh, and I did. I essentially did my preliminary practice, most of my preliminary practices, the the nundro in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Um, in I did most of them in Tibet. Some uh, the, all the all the mandala, most of the mandala offerings were actually made in in Kathmandu or outside of Kathmandu, but most of my nundro was done in in Tibet. And then I was meeting various lineage holders and receiving teachings. And then I did a, a, a lot of retreat there anywhere from a week to sometimes over a month, I was in silent retreat. During that whole period, I mean, from the time I started until, well, until recently, it was a bit, I just sort of calculated, it was a bit over three years that I was in, that, that I was in retreat, not a, in, in, and anyone in stretch, it was only ever three months. Um, 
so that was that was a wonderful experience of being able to do the practice there in those caves and and um and like the little huts and and um it was a it was a fabulous time the, the the doing all of the practices and it was also where and i write about that in the beginning of this book breathe how you want to feel in the, in the early beginning about tumo because people talk about tumo sort of a lot these days like various breathing practices and wim, wim hof the wim hof method they oftentimes people will say it's the tumo style breathing uh so i I write about that, like why it's not like the Wim Hof breathing is it is what it is. It's a it's a hyperventilating practice where you where you have a lot of uh, experience. It's a very powerful experience, but it definitely is not too. Uh, and uh, I point out what Andrew Huber, like because people like Andrew Huberman or even James Nestor, whose book A Breath I love. They well, oftentimes people will say this is Tumo style breathing, and it's it's just neat. Uh, yeah, and Wim Hof has even said that he never practiced Tumo. He never learned it. He only knew about it from reading about Lama Govinda back in. Uh, Lama Govinda is uh, Way of the White Clouds. Remember, that's an amazing book, Way of the White Clouds. And then Alexander David Neal, they both wrote about these people who could, uh, uh, the, the, what would happen when people would practice Tumo. And so there's this sort of, there's sort of this, uh, the way that, Wim Hof talks about doing his breathing and then also combines it with being in the cold. Somehow, James Nestor and Huberman, they're all the rest, all the other podcasters out there, they all say the same thing. It's Tumo style breathing, but I'm, I was just trying to set the record straight. Well, I appreciate that because that did confuse me and drive me nuts in the beginning. I was like, why do they keep saying this and nobody's yeah. saying anything? And so I'm really glad that when I read your forward, I'm glad that you are dealing with that finally yeah i mean and I, let me just say this anybody who's interested we know the wim hof breathing if you don't it's it's this um what wim hof breathing method is it's hyperventilating you just you just breathe in heavily whether the nose or the mouth he says it doesn't matter you do that about 30 40 50 times and then you exhale and hold your breath and you have an amazing it's an amazing feeling the reason that it is is that you're manipulating your blood gases and that you feel that you're super floaty and you inhale and you have all of this, you have this incredible internal experience. That's it. You do that th three or four times. It gives you, it kind of gives you a feeling of agency and what is actually happening um, um, in the body is that you're elevating your system, right? You're stressing your system by having this heavy, heavy breathing. And then you inhale and you exhale, hold your breath. And during that time, your heart rate lowers, everything begins to sort of like turn the volume down on it. So what ends up happening is you stress your system and then you calm your system down. You stress it, you calm your system down. And this is the basis for, um, for creating resiliency in your nervous system. That's what the Wim Hof method is for. That's it, right? The Tumo style breathing, I mean, Tumo starts from, from the beginning it has it has doesn't care at all about it doesn't care at all about your physically how you feel physically it's pointing towards enlightenment <laughs> you are using the body to burn up jealousy anger and all the other hangups that we have deeply embedded within our system you're using this particular method and the breathing is very slow right and you 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 inhale and and the, the holding of the breath is is key on the on the Wim Hof breath, you just breathe in, you exhale and hold your breath on the exhale. And that has a particular effect. In Tumo, you inhale and then you swallow the breath and you and you put it, you bring the breath down, you create this intra-abdominal pressure and it makes your belly poof out a little bit. And that's why they call it vase breathing because you look like a vase. Your belly looks like a vase. And you hold that breath on the inhale with this vase breath, all the while doing this very complicated visualization of with colors and various sort of like drops of essences moving up and you're essentially incinerating thought you're incinerating concepts that's i mean that's the point of of, of tumo and they call it you know the inner heat practice because part of the effect when you are when you practice tumo if you accomplish you and it's just even just a low level of accomplishment is that you do feel an incredible amount of heat emanating from your body coming into your hands and and this has been studied uh, about th this has been studied by western scientists and academics but what what used to happen and what still happens in tibet and in the himalayas is when they're practicing tumo after they've become quite accomplished 
they're able to, to sort of demonstrate the consequences of their practice. They're not doing this in order to get, uh, to, they're not doing this to get warmer, right? But part of the consequence is that your body heats up and that they go outside and they only have like a little loincloth on and they dip these sheets of like cotton sheets or hemp sheets. They, they are, they're usually white. They dip them in water and they're out in like super cold. It's like icy there and they sit in the snow and they put these like cotton towels wet around them and as they're doing the practice, the steam comes off of them because they generate heat and they dry the towels on them in sort of in below freezing weather. They also, I saw where the practices at, um, in where I was practicing Tumo in Eastern Tibet, the yogis would try to actually melt the snow away from them. Yeah, yeah. They were trying to do it like this. So this is not Wim Hof. It's not to say... I, I mean, I have nothing against Wim Hof, the Wim Hof method. It has its own uh, interesting things that's going on. It's a bit of a phenomena, but it's not too long. No, I, I, I think it's important too. There's a lot of these practices that come in that people conflate, like even like yoga and stuff. It's like, just call it something else. Just why, why conflate it with something? And people come into these practices, you know, you need, they need to know what they're getting. And if you, you're packaging it as this, then it's a little misleading. So I'm, I yeah. think it's important to... I think words matter and it's important to clarify these things for people. I to I totally agree. I totally agree, you know. I mean in the yoga like in the yoga world in the western yoga world, you know, there are a lot of claims made about what yoga does and how old it is and how old the postures are when we talk about postural yoga, the movement and whatnot, which are completely just made up. They're, they're, you know, the postural yoga for for our listeners here who don't know this, like the movement of the sun salutation, or when they when people say it goes back to Vedic times or it go, goes back thousands of years, it doesn't. It's a relatively recent invention in India that happened in the late 1800s that was a merger of, of, of yogic postures, of this exercise uh, frenzy that was happening that was brought over from Scandinavia uh, and wrestling, Indian wrestling. And, and um, so it's, it's amazing. Mark Singleton's book is perhaps one of the best books on yoga. Every, anybody that's interested in yoga, please go out and read it. It's published a while ago. It's called, uh, it's called Yoga Body, Mark Singleton. And it's a fabulous, fabulous read. And it, it just makes us, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, because we know that movement of the body is, is healthy. And let's just call it that. And if it's a couple hundred years old, or if it's a couple thousand years old, it doesn't really matter in the present when we do it. But you, you're right that words matter. And because these things can then sometimes be used if they're not put in the proper context, they can be used in a kind of power dynamic. Like I have the knowledge that I'm going to give you and, if, and, and it's put in this power dynamic. And I've seen this play out in the Tibetan Buddhist world. I've seen it play out in the Ashtanga yoga world and in various sort of other Western contexts. Um, so yeah, I just like to call things as they are. And I love my yoga practice. I love my Tibetan Buddhist practice. And, but you know, when there's problems, we should point them out, breathe them out, have some sort of catharsis, and then we move on. Yeah, I, me and you traveled in similar paths in certain ways with practices and stuff. And I, I always felt the same way, you know, you can spend a, you can waste time thinking something's one thing and it's not. So oh, yeah, part of the, it's this transmission. So like people like you doing this work, it's like, you know, a lot of this is still relatively new. So um, it's it's inevitable it's going to go through this kind of process so yeah you know, I'm very I, grateful that you're clarifying well, well thank you for that thank you I mean I think that it, it's it's true what you say and you know for example there's there's sometimes people want to talk about American Buddhism right and I mean it's fair enough to say that there's a lot of people practicing Buddhism in America uh and how that's taking shape is so young you know it's, it's just it's not even 100 years so so like what's the rush allow allow when we have <laughs> when we have an when we have an american buddha then maybe we can start talking about american buddhism but until then let's just give reverence for the, the lineages that have taught us and then just practice and be a better human being you know because all of these things whether they're yoga whether they're breathing whether they're the buddha dharma whatever practices they are they're about becoming a better human being first and second, and if you're a good Buddhist along the way, awesome. If you're a good yogi and put your head behind your put your leg behind your head, that's awesome. 
but it's about like first and foremost it's about you know opening our hearts to being more connected to each other so Wonder, wonderful yeah. there's a lot of external uh you know i think we come from a culture it's a little competitive and and really focused on the material side of things so when you see an ex like a tumo practice for instance and you see the heat there that's what you're seeing you're not really appreciating the internal stuff that's happening on the mental level on the on the subtle level uh so i mean i think that's to be expected the culture is you know that's the culture in which we yeah have. yeah i wrote in the, in the beginning of breathe how you want to feel that one of the like my initial interest my initial interest in in Buddhism and in, in in Hatha Yoga was moving to the place, this the central place of where we experience, where we experience. Hmm. Like where is that? Yeah. And and what is and and so and these practices, they tended and one of the very first practices was something so simple. I was in Pashupatina in Kathmandu, I used to go there and I, I was when I first studied yoga, not really studied. I would just like do what this guy told me to do. And it was, but he, he was really, I, he knew I was interested in meditation and he would always use the Chitti Vritti uh, Niroda, the, the line from the Patanjali Sutra that says yoga is the, the definition of yoga. Yoga is the, is the stilling of the fluctuations of the mind. Mm -hmm. Yoga is the is the sort of quieting of the fluctuations of the mind. And he was like, he was, and I still agree with what he told me. He said, the quickest way to do this, you can do all of these yoga postures. You can do all of these like pujas and, and do all of the, have all the accoutrement and the tapestries. And I love all of it. Uh, I mean, I was raised Catholic, right? So, so I like, I like, like the, <laughs> is, yeah. But he's like, if you want to like, to, to calm the fluctuations of the mind right here, right now, inhale exhale and hold your breath he's like continue to hold and in that moment where after five or ten seconds there are no thoughts i mean certainly not thinking because there's no thoughts and he's like right there and it was just that lesson and i that lesson that that we can intervene so quickly in this thing that we call i or me or the body or the mind, however it is, we can intervene so quickly vis-a-vis -vis the breath. The breath leads us to a place and then it's almost as though we let go and then it's just this pure experience. And since that time, I've always been interested to return again and again to that place of, I mean, some people call it like this pure consciousness in the Tibetan Buddha Dharma, they like to call it the, the nature of mind. There's various words for it, but I, I like to think of it just as this, at the, the centerless center of being that and we that centerless center of being and we can that breath can lead us there and i had an experience and I, this is the how the breathe how you want to feel starts out actually when i was eight years old we were um cutting firewood i was out with my father and my brother and um we, we were out, they were actually, my dad was cutting with a chainsaw and he couldn't hear anything. And my brother was like stacking the wood. And I was like, I wasn't doing the work. And I was, I was sort of wandering around and I heard a tree, like the wind was blowing. It was, this was in uh, Wyoming, the wind was blowing. And we were in this area that, that all of the trees had been, were dead from beetles, like these sort of invasive beetles. So all of the trees were dead. And I heard this loud pop and I turned around and a tree was falling towards me. And I just turned and I, and I just took a few, I just tried to run away, but it, the tree like hit me and like, just, it just tore off like my scalp and my, all the skin, my tore off all my clothes, the back of my shoes. And it, 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 it thrust me to the ground and, and it just like knocked all the wind out of me. But, um, and I fell into a little dip. I realized after my, my brother told me afterwards, I'd fall into a little dip because if not, it may have crushed, but in any case, the trees on top of me. And I immediately like, like everything started to go sort of dark. And then there were these like concentric halos of light and everything just, it was only that. And it was sort of like, I heard this sound almost like a radio station was trying to be like, and I was floating and it felt so nice. And I was floating towards these, like these halos of light. 
And, um, and then as I was going, I, uh, I heard my voice or heard my name being called, like it was across the valley. And then I felt this movement and I, I was awakened and my brother was screaming my name. He was trying to pull me out from under the log. And, and I was like, like, why did I come? Like, how come I came back? And I was like, my, I felt like my back was on fire and I was like in so much pain. And then it just like everything lights out. And, and so I don't, then my, I know now that my brother ran over, grabbed my father. They came over, they lifted the leg, the, the tree off. And when they lifted the tree off my, it just like life just came back in like, and then life came back. And that feeling of this experience of light with nothing else going on, but just this 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 experience i mean it wasn't i don't know what exactly it was i mean i don't think it was a near it may have been like maybe i knocked on the portal of death i did the door didn't open but i was like close there on that first part of it that pure experience is what i felt when that yogi at pashupatinath some 25 years later said hold your breath and just experience and that's what that when you ask me the question why did i write the breathe book that is really the reason is because I feel as though the breath, we can dial our system. We can breathe how we want to feel. And if we need it just to like get along in life for a while, or so we don't like lash out at our kids when we step on a Lego or we don't yell at our dog when he does whatever, or, or if it's something, if it's not something so acute, if it's something a little bit more expansive and spacious where we can actually dial our nervous system to be in this perfect receptacle for insight, for, for, for knowledge within, so that we can take back some of the, you can call it power, you can, or we can return the agency of our experience to here, rather than, rather than it being controlled by whatever advertisements or social media or politicians or the news or all of this stuff where, where we get just super, super agitated, we come back here and we're in more control. And that's why I, that's the link I have between that initial experience of this like calming of the of the fluctuations of the mind, that near death experience, and all of these practices that I that I that I share in the in the book. Yeah, and other people won't have to get hit by a tree. You're giving it to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like an early pointing out instruction from nature. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it was it was. Uh, yeah, it was still. It had such a profound impact on me, I think. You know, like, uh, and I write about, so in this Breathe How You Want to Feel, in the last part of the book, I write a fair, the, la the, the last third is about death. And it's about the, 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 the title of that whole third portion is Breathe How You Want to Die. And they're actual breathing practices for the death process uh, to prepare right now while we're healthy, while we're sound of mind, while we like to prepare now for the inevitable, because there's, you know, there's only one thing that is guaranteed in life is that's where we'll die. And the only thing guaranteed about that is that we don't know the timing of it. So given those two certainties, uh, it seems to me as though it, it's, it, it's, it's sort of skillful to, to work on at least some agency here within ourselves, within this thing that we call awareness or consciousness, so that there's some sort of preparation for that. And those, there's practices of, of the, the, those are mostly the sort of the letting go practices, letting go of, of, of everything that's happening. Because at death, you know, we will, if we haven't let go of whatever we own or the body or all of our experience or even our persona, right? Our, pers our persona, if we haven't let go of that, it's going to be stripped away. So one way or another is not going to be there. <laughs> so if we can work on right now, letting go, then that seems that, because that, it seems like a very exquisite opportunity, a very unique opportunity when we breathe out and we don't breathe back in and we can practice. I don't know what happens afterwards. I know all my teachers talk about what happens after death and during, so I say, I don't write about that so much. I mean, everybody has an opinion about that. And I think that that's what they are. 
our opinions. But I want whatever the case may be, I want to be as lucidly aware as I enter the portal of death as 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 possible. And we can prepare right now. And what that does right now is it is a it's a great prior it's the great prioritizer because it 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 sort of like clarifies what is really important right now while we're alive. So we have this double we have this sort of double benefit it seems. Yeah. Yeah, and you take it, it, does, it is very skillful, and you, well, it's also courageous, because a lot of people don't want to deal with death or think about it. They want to pretend, yeah. just pretend. Uh, but you, the enthusiasm you show and the way you talk about it, it's like, no, no, this is interesting, actually. This is an interesting event that we all get to do. We all get to do. Yeah, so let's, like, yeah. prepare for, to make it the best event. Why not, you know? Like, it's it just seems like such a... I mean, it is, it is, it, it truly is unknown, you know, like, and, and it may be if, if, if one is a strict materialist, uh, where there's nothing that happens after, after this thing dies, um, at least it will have been the, you would have prioritized your life to live really well during it because you knew that, that and if there is something on the other side, whatever the case, whatever that, that is, that lucidity seems to be very um a, a key element to take with us because we can't i don't know what else we can take but this be, besides this lucidity of awareness and we can practice that all the time we can practice it all that we can practice it in between breaths we can practice it with our breathing practices we can practice it right as we're falling asleep in that hovering there or right as we're waking up from sleep that hovering there for just a moment to recognize uh, these, these moments, these in-between moments. And uh, it's one reason why I love holding my breath so much, I think, uh, in these practices is because it, it, um, it takes you into an in-between moment that seems pregnant with possibility. So I agree. And do you have a preference of this? I think this is an appropriate question for you. Is there a preference between the inhale versus the exhale hold? No. I... It depends on what I, what the effect, and this is this is that's a, that's a good way to approach the the this breathe how you want to feel this book. What I do in the in the first part of it is I I give these five uh, principles or five tools that then you can apply into your daily breath breathing when you're exercising, before during meditation, uh, before and during sleep, all of this sort of what what might be happening during life, and so. And what I, the way that I present it, I don't say, I don't present do this breathing practice because it will make you feel like this because it is, it doesn't work that way because we're all individuals. And, but there are some general principles with physiology. And, and again, it's just, they're general. They don't, they aren't for sure to work with everybody because it depends on your nervous system and how, the, how, how the, these react. So for example, Right before this podcast, um, I needed to be on, right? I wanted to wake up. I wanted to be focused, but had be sort of spacious. And so right before, I just did like a two-minute breathing intervention where I just took, I, I, I just breathed through, through my nose. I breathed a little bit stronger, and then I inhaled and held my breath for as long as I could, and then I exhaled. And at the bottom of the exhale, I just let the breath come back very slightly. So why would I do that? If we inhale and hold our breath on the inhalation, generally that excites us in the sense that generally that wakes us up. It is an elevating practice. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. That is the, 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 the part of the nervous system that's responsible for focus, for activation, for getting things done, right? Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system that rests in digest mode, we can also do that. And when we inhale and we exhale and hold our breath on the exhale, generally that turns on the rest and digest mode. So if, I, if I'm not going to do a lot of, when I wake up in the morning, I'm not going to do a lot of practices where I'm emphasizing the external hold because I want to be waking up. Right? The same way for inhaling and exhaling. If we exhale for longer than we inhale, it's relaxing. So you've heard like, um, maybe you've heard of uh, somebody says, breathe in for a four count and out for a six count. You know, breathe in one, two, three, or four, exhale for a six count. This will generally be down regulating. Whereas if you swap it, if you breathe in for longer 
then you breathe out like that is elevating that is stimulating so it depends on what you want and this is the whole thesis for breathe how you want to feel is that we have this physiology that we can dial just like an old school boom box with like the volume and balance and treble or like a like a um a recording board where you turn up the we can dial our nervous system with our breath and that's that's why i say we can breathe how we want to feel right and so this is like this 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 that i just described is is the very robust second principle of breathe how you want to feel the first principle is it's not about breathing it's about awareness so as and it's not only because i come from a meditation background and that i sort of emphasize that we have to know what's going on within ourselves principally but also what's happening around us so once we know once we have a feeling for what's happening within us and how that's making us feel otherwise known as interoception interoceptive awareness once we know that then we can intervene with a breathing intervention to make us to, to, to breathe if we want to change our state so i set up this thing this acronym of air which starts out with awareness seeing how we are right now and then if i want to change it then i do a, the intervention the i i do some sort of breathing intervention five minutes ten minutes do whatever we want and then the r is the regulation throughout the day so this awareness integration regulation and it's not to say that we need to be like hyper focused on our breath every single twenty five thousand breaths that we have a day that's not what I'm, I'm not saying like we should get neurotic about our breath at all but what i am saying is that when we notice that every time we when we notice that we're stressed or or usually what we only notice it afterwards we can use a little bit of we can use a little bit of of contemplation like why is this happening and it could be that every it could be that that every time you you're on your phone and you're scrolling social media there this is actually a thing people when they're checking their email or on their phone and they're scrolling you watch watch your friends or your especially your kids they're oftentimes their their head will be jutted out their mouth will be open and they'll be like I mean, you, you can even see it here. Like, it's just the mouth is open. They're scrolling mindlessly. You watch and people will be holding their breath. They're unconsciously holding their breath. Now I've said that holding the breath was, like I say in the book that holding your breath, conscious holding of the breath can be used in an amazing way. Unconsciously holding your breath while you're in a poor posture and you're getting all of these hits of this, this sort of all of these messages on on social media or on on the or off of the internet of inadequacy essentially is what social media does to us right it, it probes uh, especially with the younger generation but and you have your mouth open you're messing with your blood gases and so then when you come away from that you wonder why you're feeling agitated you're feeling why you're feeling stressed and whatnot well what did what just happened so when we notice that or or for example there, I mean, we, we can use our awareness to, to, to see where in our life we're getting these sort of like low levels of stress, this chronic stress. And then you can do the intervention to help combat that. There's that level, but there's also the in the moment type of thing. This sort of when, a, when an acute stressor hits, what to do, right? And we have, I present a number of options, but I would like people just to like have in their pocket what to do when they pull on to the, 101 and it's like three hours of traffic ahead of them and they, their neck like this and they grit their teeth and they start they're grabbing their or when their kid or your partner does that thing or whatever these acute stressors are in the moment when we recognize that we can do something we can do an intervention and then one of the main things i recommend to do because generally these are elevating these are these are stressing is to just simply the first thing i say is put your tongue on the roof of your mouth that's the first thing. It's the correct oral posture. It also stimulates the vagus nerve. So it, 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 it helps you stimulate that relaxation response. Just simply putting your tongue on the roof of your mouth with your lips slightly closed. And then you just find the breath and then you just extend the exhale. Like that. It's so simple, but I can't tell you how many people come to me and tell me that they... they can't re they 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 have this and they have a whole host of other things that they know to do 
and they say that they just don't do them because they it's like they have the knowledge but they don't apply it and i i i, I talk about this in the book as the long road to the zafu if you heard this thing in zen there's a like the long road to the zafu is like when we start meditating like we're super stoked and like yeah oh, yeah my you know Guru gave me my mantra or I got my new meditation cushion or I got my new mala or whatever the case may be. We're sort of like in a honeymoon phase. So we're like, go for it. And then after, you know, a few weeks or a little while, it sort of wears off and whatnot. And, but your meditation cushion is still there. And the meditation cu cushion in the Zen tradition is called a Zafu. So the Zafu. And so it remains there. And you see it. And you know you should put your butt down on it and meditate. But... You, you start to go do that, but you're like, mm, I better like light some more incense and maybe I better sweep up the room or maybe I better like fix a cup of tea. You do everything to procrastinate from just sitting on the cushion. And then you sit on the cushion, you're like, I better check my email one last time. You know, I better set my timer, my calm timer, my headspace timer, whatever the case may be. And you do everything but meditate. That's the long road to the Zafu. And this, this thing is also completely applicable to just short breathing interventions to breathe how you want to feel that you we have to do it and that's it once we start doing it the dividends pay off immediately and they will be a reminder of themselves to continue to do the practice mm -hmm. and i lay out a number of these practices in the book mm. yeah I'm, I'm thinking like like mutual dependent arising like when you have the feeling of like oh i feel good and you're like well how did i get here the breathing practice so now there's an incentive that's back and forth, the cause is the effect, the effect is the cause, where you make that link. Yeah. And I really like what you say too, that you're putting this throughout the whole day. Like this isn't just a practice. This is a daily way. This is a way of being in the world that you can adopt. That's going to give you more agency, as you said. So you won't have to keep getting swept away or you can catch yourself and you have some agency, like the dials on the boom box, as you say, I think. That's yeah, really Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, they, and because this, you know, because our breath is it, it, we can use different methods. We could like when a stress, like when an acute stressor hits, we could, we could pray to Buddha. We could say, we could say Ave Maria or something, or we could, um, we could do a positive affirmation or we, we could do a lot of things. We, there's a lot of things. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things. I'm just saying that the breath is the thing that affects immediately. Like at, while you're doing it, you can actually feel when you exhale, when you just inhale and then you exhale slowly, you can actually feel your heart rate slowing down. I mean, that is like, because some of these things, I've been doing some of these things for a long time and I can't say whether what benefit has come from it, right? You know, after you do, after you do, a, after you do 100,000 prostrations, Right to that Tonka, I prostrated a hundred thousand times too. It was good. I got like you know, it felt good. It was like I felt elated and whatnot. But can I say, like, like while I was doing it, that I could feel an immediate effect? Like the cause, the causality part of it is is pretty amazing, you know. And I might be comparing two different things, but and I'm happy that I did a lot of prostrations to the Buddha. Uh, and um, but you know, I just. In this day and age, even for meditators, like I have seen so th this idea, and this is why, and I'm speaking to all of the meditators right now. You know, the the notion that so oftentimes when we whatever tradition we have within within um, a, a, with whatever meditation tradition, oftentimes the instruction, the antidote to distraction or the antidote to lethargy or the antidote to excitability of the mind. The, the instruction or the antidote is something that's done with the mind, right? And that's a heavy lift. Using the mind to overcome the mind, it's a heavy lift. And you, you could be like, yeah, but why did Guru Mche say to do that? Or why did the Buddha say to do that? Well, he was, they were teaching to a little bit different demographic. The monks and nuns that were rolling across Northern India did not have, I mean, they had stress. They, we all, they were all subject to birth, old age, sickness, and death. And they probably had financial strains and, and all the rest. We're in a particular moment right now that our, the strains and stresses that we have come at us 
at a, such a, a speed, a degree, and like weightiness that I don't think was present among the monks and nuns who were gathered around the Buddha. So for us, the for 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 us to have something to that isn't the mind that we use the breath which is a very somatically based experience right we we turn the attention to the breath it has this immediate effect and what i'm suggesting and in the meditation chapter what i suggest to new and old meditators is to utilize the breath to 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 sort of create that space within you for the insights that are sort of waiting for you with the meditation practice. Because if not, I've, I've seen this for years and years among my fellow meditators, among myself, where you, you utilize in the mind and it's actually becoming more constricted. The mind is becoming more sort of tighter rather than opening to the spaciousness that is inherent in the mind itself. And we can use the breath for this purpose. Yeah, that's very insightful. And I've seen the same thing and I have a some ideas and I think I, of why I think that a lot of the meditators, do you tell me if you agree, well, the Western idea of consciousness is, is essentially thoughts. It's in the thinking mind where that was never the understanding coming out of these traditions. It was a full bodied, the idea of consciousness was much larger in scope. And so if I think what you're doing is hitting on a central point that, you know, the, the Buddha is same thing, teaching the tongue on the mouth, breathing i mean it brings us right into the body which is a much fuller sense of self and consciousness and like you said there's all these things waiting so when they're trying to deal with things with a, a general western dealing with something with the mind they're picking that such a tiny bit of real estate of what actually is the mind and asking it to do this heavy lifting that it's just not going to be able to do and so they get defeated the long road to the Zafu is totally understandable because it's yeah. exhausting. <laughs> it's, abs it, it, it's super exhausting. There, yeah, it's not, you know, it just is, a, it, it, there's been some, it's a matter of skill, like this upaya, right? It's the skill and means of applying. And I'm not saying that we need this all the time, because if you're all, if you're off on your 10 day Vipassana retreat, maybe on day eight, you don't need to dial your nervous system. Maybe it's all chill. Maybe you're doing sort of, maybe during your month or maybe even just this morning you sat down and you didn't need to i'll give you an, i'll give you an example of this during covid right at the beginning of covid i was doing a, a lot of very intense breathing practices before i meditated before the day so i wake up i do about 20 25 30 minutes of this very intense breathing and whatnot and then i would and then i would sort of tone down and i would sit in and i would just sit in my i would do my meditation practice and and what I found was, and it had worked for like the previous two years. It was sort of like what I was doing. And COVID runs, comes around and I, I didn't change up my practice. But what I noticed was that when I, into my meditation, it was, it was quite agitated. And then when I went into post-meditation, into my normal day with see my wife and, and my work day and whatnot, I was so tense. And it was, so what was I, what, what was happening there? Well, when I was started my meditation practice, when I started the breathing practice before I was meditating, I didn't check in. I just I just did what I what I was what I what I always had done for the previous two years. I was sort of doing this, and I was elevating myself. But my 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 baseline was already that very elevated because I was worried about my friends and family who were dying, and I was like just afraid of the air. We there's like crazy times with COVID, right? So. I was already in an elevated state and then I was going and I was actually doing something that was like pushing me over the edge. And then I was going to meditation, be frustrated. And then after post meditation was agitated. Like this is a very, and none of those things, like the practice, this elevating breathing practice, there's nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't skillfully applied. I didn't need it then. What I needed was even when I woke up in the morning, I needed to down regulate because my mind was thinking about all the people who were sick and dying. I need to just sort of downregulate and take that in. So the way that I present in Breathe How You Want to Feel is here's your toolkit. Here, here are these principles. And then you need to apply it to your particular situation in life right now, which is always changing. This principle of change is thread throughout my book. This anicca, 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 right? There's this, like, things are, are always flowing. And we need to be the, the agent 
of our of how we you know i start out right at the beginning of the book where victor Frankl says in 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 uh, man in search of meaning this guy victor Frankl wrote that book while he was in a, in a concentration camp nazi concentration camp and he wrote in between stimulation and response there's a space and in that space is where freedom is found and that's what we that this is what our breath gives us it gives us this space because right now so often we have we're stimulated with whatever happens in our life or in the news or in politics or like whatever we get stimulated and immediately we react there's no gap and when we are reacting to all of the stimulation around us we aren't in control at all we have given away our agency and so what this what we do in this book is that that this because the stress that's happening around us is guaranteed and it's not going to change <laughs> right i mean it's the news cycle politics you know family dynamics financial whatever it's not going to i mean it it's not really going to change much so what can the only thing that can change is our the way that we react that's the, that is the only thing that we really have agency over so the breath gives us a, a, a like a handle on it so you know the all that stress is still going to be there but the way that we are with it is the thing that changes because if we have stress and the suffering that sometimes is associated with it and then it happens while we're suffering if we don't want that suffering to happen that just is a second layer of stress or second layer of suffering so the the idea here is that we recognize that we're already that that the stress has happened that the, that, that 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 this is happening and then we just we're able to with something in our toolkit we're able to pause right if we have the wherewithal to do that like sometimes stress happens and we don't have time like our kids running across the street it's not like gonna be like oh let me calm down before i go run and get them no that's not what i'm saying but i'm saying when we have the time and for those people who are probably listening to this podcast you're on the spiritual path which would indicate <laughs> that you have time that's a that's a real good indication uh that this precious human rebirth that you have is being utilized well and that you have a little bit of time so in that stressor happens what do we do we down regulate with one of these breathing interventions that, that uh, i present so many of them in the book and the idea is just to, to get back agency that the world around us has usurped from us yeah yeah and I, that's great and i think that you know obviously the more you do this the stronger you'll get the more the more it's there for you and so even when you do have that moment, like you have to just go and act, first off, that's rare, but you'll be more in a better position to do that anyways. In those Absolutely. Times. Totally, totally. You'll be in a better position psychologically, you'll, like your nervous system will be dialed. You'll be making wiser choices. Yeah. It also yeah. has a sense, what do you think? Do you, um, like a, the, sen the, the strong sense of self begins to relax as well. Which is why we get so triggered anyways, because we, we got this self-importance, this arrogance, we're the greatest thing in the world. The breathing kind of puts us in this state of like, oh, it's all right. It's all kind of okay. No, no problem. Yeah. Well, at least we'll begin to, at least we'll begin to recognize, um, we can recognize the, this, this thing that is central to our experience and all the things that happen around us. This thing that's central to our experience of like when I say central, I mean like it is it is predicated upon it. That is this just awareness, right? This pure awareness. And how is that? What is the experience of that? And we can, and if you've had the point out instructions or if you've had like whatever else, if you sat for years and years, that's awesome. But my contention, my in my observation is not, we can experience that regardless of dogma or tradition or anything it's, it's it is so readily apparent and we can when we when we when we place the mind on the breath we have the inhalation the exhalation and the two pauses in between that becomes extraordinarily instructive and beca and becomes a metaphor for life well it's real and it's happening every moment so even if you do Absolutely some big retreats, if you can lose it, like it doesn't have to follow you. A lot of people complain the post meditation; they just want to go back and have these 
states essentially they achieve these nice states but how do yeah. you make it as the richie davidson says a trait and i think yeah. this is, this is the skillful way and it's so simple yeah it's like uh, the way that i present this is not um it's it's sort of progressive in a way in terms of we have to develop this interoception the way that our body is feeling and the, and the way that our body the signals our body is giving to our mind and how that makes us feel so there's a little bit of honing of our awareness right the dialing on the on the nervous it's just learning a little bit about the the breath right? i just described it but the way that we breathe many of us breathe in a very dysfunctional way uh we have various we're, uh, and I talk about those and ways to correct them because those the dysfunctional breathing ways that we breathe that that are contributing to stress in our life and for this podcast contributing to like obscuring reality as it is our mm -hmm. breath is actually contributing to, to this obscuration mm -hmm. we we can they're just habits they're, 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 these are just breathing habits and we can we just have to be aware of the habit to change it and then we can change it and so I present those and then I I talk a lot about sleep as well because oh, sleep is I ask you about sleep. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> sleep is so critically important. You know, this, this, this time of, of just pushing on through and just going on four or five hours of sleep. Like we know that the, the restorative, uh, uh, the, the way that sleep restores the mind and the body is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And so, and the most important aspect of the way that we breathe during sleep is how we breathe during the day. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for those of us who have insomnia or uh, various forms of, of, um, of apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, if you snore, if you wake up with dry lips or dry mouth, or if you're, if you're waking up super lethargic or with brain fog, these are all very strong indicators mm -hmm. of, of a breathing, a breathing disordered sleeping. And mm -hmm. it's, its foundation is in the date, how you were breathing during the daytime. So it's and not so much about taping at night and stuff then from your point of view. Taping at night is a great thing to do. It's a great thing to do because that corrects, that corrects how we're breathing. The, the, so as you said, so, and I, I have this recommendation in my book as well. Um, so you can use just some, some tape, um, medical tape, like very, this, like almost like parchment tape. It's, it's, it's medical tape. Don't use, don't use duct tape or just household tape. And, whatnot. and the idea is it sounds crazy. And, and I'll tell you why it's important that we do this, but you just tape your, you can just put a little bit over your lips. I mean, some people tape their whole mouth, especially if they're on a CPAP machine because of the idea that you don't want to have any air coming in, um, through the mouth. But, um, but, the way that I do it is I just put it here and it just keeps the lips. It trains, retrains your, the, the muscles and your lips, just to have your lips slightly closed. Your teeth aren't touchy. Your tongue is resting on the roof of your mouth. It provides the ideal oral and, um, and tongue posture to breathe through your nose. And the single, like if anybody, if you're listening to this and you want to get into the, you can, you can read my book, but the single most, I'd write this, the single most important takeaway in my book, this, the single most important takeaway is to breathe through your nose all the time. Don't breathe through your mouth. Unless you're eating, you know, unless you're eating, speaking, or having high intensity exercise or swimming, breathe through your nose. And everybody's gonna come like, no, I have a deviated septum, or I got this, I got allergies, all of these. I talk about all of that stuff in the book. But if you want the, the single quickest way to upgrade your health and clarity for meditation, is to breathe through your nose, right? Breathe light, slow, and deep. That's how our, our daytime breathing. If we breathe LSD breathing, light, slow, and using our diaphragm deep, this will have an incredible impact on the way that you sleep, right? It's not gonna be a, a cure-all. The breath isn't a panacea, but it is because it is so intimately connected with everything we experience in our body and our mind, it's crazy not to optimize the way that we breathe. So you're just saying, so, right. So you're just saying, in addition to the mouth taping, if we take care through the day, that's going to go a long way. You go a huge long way. I even recommend taping your mouth while you're working on the computer. Yeah. Just to get used to, to begin to bring some awareness to breathing through your nose and lightly and slowly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. I tape if I run, like if I'm running or doing like a, some exercise at home. 
uh, just to remind yourself that I don't really need too much anymore, but especially back when I started that, it was very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it, when you have a little bit higher, uh, intensity, uh, yeah. exercise, having your, your mouth closed, it's, it's, a uh, it's a trip, literally yeah. a trip, uh, because it makes you stay within your form. Yeah, it does. Yeah. You won't go outside yeah. of what you can do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so can I ask a one uh, one more question since I got you? So I, I really like the approach. I've talked to a lot of meditators and, and three-year retreatants on the on the podcast. Uh -huh. um, and I think there's a lot of value in the way you approach the retreat. I know I know other people. I I, I did mine yours uh, the same way you did actually. Going in and doing bits and coming out and going in. I think it allows for an integration of the practices. Did you yeah. find did you find that useful in the way you approach it? Was that your takeaway or no? Yeah, I mean, I did, um, you know, for those for those 10 years that I was in Nepal and in Tibet, it was so intensive that the, the practice periods were so intensive. And and I was also surrounded by such a, you know, the culture was such that um, that I didn't really feel as though I was like I wasn't like sort of thinking about the integration part of it. It was only when I came back to the West, got married, and then and then came back here and and started sort of living and, and working with the different kinds of stresses that you know like are part of my culture, uh, but I just I just hadn't been part of for for the better part of a decade. Um, I really started to see the benefits of applying. Now, I think for some individuals going in for a long term retreat, because you turn the because you turn the the heat up, like you know the way that if you spread it out. It's though you have a, a, a simmer on for this for, for a longer period of time. Whereas, whereas for, a, I mean, at least it was my experience when I would go in for like three months, a little bit over three months, multiple times retreats, it was like the, the, the heat was turned way high. And for some individuals um, that works, you know, for others, because you gotta, you gotta, I mean, you gotta remember that when these, all of these retreatants were doing this stuff in Tibet and Nepal and India and all of these places, when they were being recommended to go in for, for these long-term retreat, they were psychologically stable. Like they weren't worried about, yeah, they, they, they were, they were ready for that. And, and so the idea that in the West that we might be having sometimes people who have uh, various issues, psychological issues, uh, it seems to me as though it might be more skillful to work on those um, at least on a course level and have them fairly sorted before you move into this more subtle realm where you're working in a very nuanced way, uh, very, very deep way. But if, because if it's not, I mean, you and I know, like how many times have we seen people sort of like pop their top when they go into, uh, when they go into longer term retreat, it's a, it's a shame that their teacher, their guru or their Dharma brothers and sisters didn't point that out and say, Hey, just a second. Like maybe we should, maybe we should sort, you know, the issues that these issues out uh, beforehand, because because if not, it just uh, yeah, Spir spiritually induced neuroses is so hard to watch. It's well, like, the the reason I, I say so that's funny. I, I agree, but and and everybody's different. Like you know, we that's always sort of the caveat for any conversation. Everybody's different. Same with the breath. But there's something I think that's that's nice about doing the retreat and stretching it out like you said that low simmer that goes also with your breath practice and a lot of the practices i teach like embodiment practice alexander technique where it's like we learn to do keep these things going all 24 7 yeah and it's a it's like it that's really what we want instead of a great big experience bam and then back into this situation you're like now how do i apply these two things it's so it's so true just these very, very powerful, because this happens in the breathwork world as well. These very strong experiences, like, especially that's why people are so addicted to the Wim Hof stuff is because it, it's like a drug. But the nature of that experience is that it starts to wane and then people are left with like, what now? Uh, and so, and, you know, experiences are just that. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with experiences. I dig experiences too. And I dig like super trippy ones. And I, I, I love that. But but we have to recognize that, that that they are just that. This low simmer also part of the benefit of this low simmer of just this consistency of practice with with smaller spikes of intensity. I think it 
it gives us a little bit more access to the nuances of both the practices and their effect on us. We can we can we can titrate them a little bit. We can modulate uh, them, and we can see the effect on us and the effect that we are having on others when we do those practices, right? So uh, I think that that there's an appreciation. I mean, anybody that's practiced the Dharma for a long time knows, like, just a simple instruction like uh, place your attention on your breath. What that means to the first time you do it to to a twenty year practitioner is, is like it, it's worlds apart. You know, and and uh, and it's only just comes from just the re repetition of the practice, and the, it, it's a very nuanced uh, type of effect. Uh, and that's why that's why long term practitioners oftentimes give good advice because they know how it was back then, and they can give the advice at, at those appropriate times. Yeah, I, I agree, hundred percent. And I so I, I do I love your book because of this. I like the way you approach it. I I think it's really valuable for anyone. And, but especially Dharma practitioners and, and long, new and long term. I yeah, you thank you. Here. Um, is, is there anything that I've left out that you would like to hit on before we go? Gosh, you know, I didn't even know what we were going to talk about and that we went back and talked about the retreat time and, and Tibet and all that. It's it's awesome to to revisit that. I mean, that was such a uh, just an important time in my life. And I love the simplicity of my practice now of, of, of breath awareness and, and this open presence um, a practice. Um, so, um, I don't think that there's, I, I, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, uh, I feel, I feel very full with our conversation. So thanks for having me on. Yeah. I really enjoyed meeting you. This was wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. I've been a fan for many years. So it was such a pleasure to finally meet you in this new book. I, I was so surprised when you wrote it, but it was, it makes perfect sense in lieu of your past. It makes perfect sense. And I'm, you're the perfect person, I think, to write this book. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, there is a bit of a, uh, you know, in some ways in the shadow of the Buddha was like a, kind of a, such a complicated, yeah. like there's, there's like lots of, and, and I've, my life, my life, my practice has been one of, of, uh, of catharsis really mm -hmm. of just like, and trying to come down to the essence yeah. of, of, of the most important, like the, of, of what's the, the key, what's key and, and what's most important and for me, that has been like a, an essentialization mm -hmm. of practices rather than a sort of flowering of, of, of practices. Mm. Um, and not to say that flowering, I loved all of that. Like, I, I love that as well. But uh, but right now, where I am right now, there's been this like distill. it's more of kind of a distillation, an essentialization. Mm. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. That's very wise. So nice meeting you. Nice to meet you and uh, look forward to our paths crossing in person at some point. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. I would definitely like that. And um, good luck with the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Take it easy. All right. Bye-bye.